Hello, this is Lucy O'Hagan from Wild Awake and today I'm out in the beautiful spring surroundings of County Meath and I invite you to join me on this spring forage and curcum. So we're going to explore about 10 to 15 different species. We don't have a lot of time to go into lots of detail but really I want this to become like a story of becoming this place. We're going to be tracking the landscape, tracking the patterns of the different plants and trees and finding a way to become this place by interacting with it, by eating it and by giving thanks for it. So let's head off to begin our journey. So around 12,000 years ago, Ireland was covered in ice and snow. And as the ice and snow receded after that ice age, trees began to spring up on the land. And those were trees that were carried here by birds and animals and also seeds that were blown here. So beha or birch is one of the first trees that will come in after an area has been cleared. And it's really characteristic of this landscape. We find it a lot throughout Ireland, it's a native species. And we know it to be birch by the bark. So birch trees have this very papery bark with these horizontal lenticels. So at this time of year, the sap is rising and it's that feeling that we get inside ourselves at this time of year. You know, we're coming out of our winter slumber. We're beginning to awaken and slowly our energy is rising. So this is happening with the trees as well. So those sugars and starches which have been locked in the roots all over the winter are now beginning to be released and the water that is pumping up through the trees to open the leaves is unlocking those sugars and sending them all over the tree. So we can take advantage of this by tapping the sap. Uh, so there are a few different trees that you can do this with. Birch is the most plentiful here in Ireland. Um, and the practice that I always teach people is just to cut a small branch. And cut like this one. And if you come close, you'll be able to see the sap beginning to drip. So this begins happening usually um, after the hazel tree has started to flower. Um, the sap started to rise here in mid-February and the peak of it is really today on the spring equinox and it will continue to flow until the leaves start to open and then it will stop. So we can gather this sap by just placing a bottle over the top and either taping or using some of our great forest school knots and tying it onto the branch. Bearing in mind that as this bottle fills, it will become heavier. So you want to make sure that your knots are very good. So we'll leave that there to gather. So below the birch here, we have another really um, easily identifiable plant, which grows all over our gardens and in meadows. And it is, of course, the Kesserban, the dandelion, also known as Lusna Bride. So Bridget's flower, and that's because on St. Bridget's Day or in bulk, the 1st of February is usually when the first dandelion flowers emerge. And it's like uh, Bridget's fiery arrow or her fiery spear coming up from the land, bringing back the light. So dandelion is an amazing plant. I've made a whole video about them. Uh, extremely medicinal, really high in vitamins and minerals amazing diuretic, um, which is why they're known as wet the beds. Um, and the leaves of the plant are edible. Now they're quite bitter. And if we find them growing in the shade, they're gonna be less bitter. And I mean, bitters are really good for us. You know, we have like over 300 different bitter um, receptors in our bodies. So it is important to think about, you know, what was the diet of our ancestors and how have we taken bitters out of our diets in this modern age? So they perform a very important function, 
but if they're not to your taste you can cook them or you can put them in the fridge for a couple of days and that will reduce the amount of um, the bitter taste while still having the bitter compound. So we can eat the leaves, we can put them into salads, we can treat them just like we would spinach or any leafy green. If we go to the very base of the dandelion, we'll also find these tiny little unformed dandelion flower heads and we can pick these and they do really well if we just cover them in salt, if you gather a lot and preserve them in salt and they become like these little capers that you can add into salads and really nice and like couscous and tabale and different kinds of um, yeah, salads. Um, and then the flowers, again, we can use them to throw into salads to add a little bit of color. We can make wine with them. They can go into meads. You can make a really nice dandelion fizz with them. Um, you can make dandelion pancakes. So many different ways to use the dandelion. And then something which I started doing last year was when the dandelion stem becomes really, really tall, you can find them, you know, up to two feet at times. We can pick the stem, use the flower in whatever way we will, and then dry the stem and use it in weaving. So you can use it for weaving just in the way that you might have seen Carol weaving her coil basketry or other small rush baskets we can use the dandelion stem for or for making cordage. There's also a way to play the dandelion trumpet. So hopefully we'll hear more signs of the dandelion trumpet this year. So that is the Kesterban, which also has an edible root. And I'll not go on because I could be here all day talking about the dandelion and we have so much more to look at. So we really haven't needed to move very far to find loads of incredibly nutritious and delicious spring plants. So another one of those, which I'm sure you'll be very familiar with, is the nettle. So the nettle, I mean, who hasn't been stung by a net nettle if you haven't lived? Um, amazing edible. Again, it's one that I rambled on about for about 15 minutes in a different video. It's like a powerhouse of nutrition, vitamins and minerals, great for inside our body, great for outside of our body, our skin, our hair, our nails. Amazing for wildlife, like so many different kinds of butterflies depend solely on the nettle. So we can eat them and encourage them to grow more. So a good way to do this is just to pick off these top four to six leaves. So just the tops of them. You can come along with a pair of scissors. You don't need to be a hero. And that will encourage the dandelion to, or the dandelion, the nettle to grow back more and more. So we can tend our very own patch of nettles and we can take them again. We can cook with them. We're going to add them into our bread and our pesto today. Great for teas, great for cordials. Um, can, we can make string with them later on in the year. Nientog is just like such an important plant to our ancestors and such an important plant that thrives around us all of the time. Humans have such a strong connection to this plant. So one that I really recommend that we go out and pick at this time just so that we feel that spring tonic that they offer us so freely. So that is Nientog nettle. So another spring plant, I mean, it's just um, the real sign of spring having arrived is of course the creme, the wild garlic. Um, so a very old word for um, wild garlic in Irish is crim um, and supposedly there was a festival called Crimfesh which was when the tenants of the land had to provide a feast for the owners of wild garlic. Um, so really like abundant plant when we find it, it will just carpet these shady damp woodland floors um, and very easy to identify. The smell of first of all gives it away and it has this very simple leaf structure that's long lance shaped and really the best way is just to crush it 
and smell it and you smell that very strong pungent oniony garlicky smell so it's in the onion family um, and a very good like kind of stimulant for your body at this time and also very good um like antiseptic it would have been used for wounds and things in the past as well now one plant to be very aware of when you're gathering wild garlic is the lords and ladies so this plant here and you know when we get to it and we look at it we think you know they don't look that alike the lords and ladies has this very pointed tip it has these little ears and it has veins which spread out around the leaf but when we get one that's very young the little ears just aren't just as obvious and as you can see it loves to grow right in among the wild garlic so one way that I love to teach people the difference is on the lords and ladies, there's this line, this vein that runs the whole frame of the leaf, almost like a little gutter the whole way around it. But definitely a lesson in mindful foraging that when we go out, we don't just cut huge swathes of things, that we definitely slow down and we observe what we're picking. And when we get home as well, we're sorting through our harvest and making sure that no little plants like this one have snuck in. Such a beautiful plant as well, just because it's toxic doesn't mean that we should pull it up or completely ignore it. The Aram Lily, the Lords and Ladies, has a beautiful flower which emerges and then these beautiful uh, berries, which are such an important food source for lots of mice and voles and birds. So just because we can't eat it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a very important function in this woodland ecosystem. So that's the Lords and Ladies, also known as Aram Lily or Cuckoo Pint, and the Wild Garlic, which we'll be using today with our butter. So it's said that the Wild Garlic would have been picked and the bog butter would have been wrapped in leaves of Wild Garlic. This is just one such leaf that they may have used and people have on earth bog butters that are wrapped in the leaves of wild garlic. So I can only imagine how delicious that must be. So we're going to combine it with our butter in a moment. So we have the lemon of the north, also known as field sorrel. Uh, so this is a plant that loves to grow out in the grassland. It grows from a rosette at the base. So all the leaves stems protrude from this one central rosette and if this is one plant which could be mistaken for lords and ladies so it's important to look for that little vein gutter around the outside and also the little ears on this really look like a pair of scissors has been taken to them and just snipped them right up the center so it's less curved and more of a sharp um, edge to them which corresponds to the sharp, lemony, almost Granny Smith apple peel taste of this plant. It's what it would have been used before the introduction of lemons. And it's such a great addition to any salads. It's brilliant with fish. Um, you can make cordials with it. Just such a delicious plant and one that I absolutely love to show people on my foraging walks. It's quite glossy and as the leaves get older, they tend to get this little spray of um, red dots over the top of them, which is not nothing to be feared. It just means that that is an older leaf than say this fresh new green growth. Docking, docking, in and out, take the sting of nettle out. One of the most common questions I get asked on a foraging walk is, do dock leaves really work to take the sting out of nettles? It's something I grew up with. It's something so many people I meet and know have grown up with. And the answer is yes, but it is not exactly the leaf that we're looking for. At this time of year, if we go down into this rosette, we'll find one of the 
unopened leaves, which is covered in this little papery sheath. And if we pull that out, then we'll find this gel in the dock leaves. Okay, you can see that. And this is almost like our native aloe vera. So for any burns, stings, bites or cuts, it's this gel which lives in these young leaves that we can use to rub onto our skin. So the answer is yes. Dock leaves really do help soothe nettle stings, but not as you might think. They're also edible. So amazing. So you can cook them up in a lasagna or eat the very young ones raw if you like a bit of bitter. Garvloss, cleavers, robin run the hedge, sticky willies, sticky weed, goose grass, so many names, so many uses, such an amazing, fun plant. It sticks to you. It's covered in all these tiny little hairs so you can creep up on somebody and see if you can get one of these on. We can probably still do that, right? Rather than touch each other, we can just stick little cleavers to each other to show we care. So this is in the coffee family, which is the bed straw family. Uh, think of it like little pipe cleaners for your lymphatic system. Great spring tonic. We're going to make a juice from it. I love to infuse it in water, leave it overnight in the fridge and then drink it and it tastes like spring in a glass. It's amazing. Um, you can eat the really, really young ones if you cook them because they're covered in this kind of like Velcro like hairs. You don't really want to eat it raw because um, so yeah, it's great just as a juice, amazing as a tincture um, and really fun to make crowns out of. And we can also gather it for our fire making and we can even gather the little seeds from the cleavers and roast them to make a kind of coffee substitute. And because it's in the Rubiaceae family, in the coffee family, it does have a small amount of caffeine in there, but it's this gorgeous, earthy, nutty, delicious drink that's native and grows all over our hedgerows. The Latin name for this is Gallium Aperine, which kind of translates as milk sieve. Uh, so we can gather big bunches of cleavers and people would have strained the milk through that to like filter out any of the impurities. So you can do this as well. And we'll do that as we're making our juice with our Garvelos August Beha with the cleavers and the birch sap. I remember purple stained fingers. I remember crayfish finding their way towards my line under the bridge. I remember a puffball the size of a beach ball that we weren't allowed to eat. I remember finding hazelnuts and thinking that they weren't even real. What do you remember? Something which attracts me to foraging now more than ever is the unquestioning abundance. The unwavering cycles which, as the world feels as though it's unravelling around me, reminds me that the primroses will still flower. The bluebells will come again and the sap will always rise. Just as they have done for thousands of years before now. These generous, continuous cycles in nature remind me to take a breath, to put my feet on the ground and to give thanks to that well of wisdom which bubbles up from the land. It also reminds me that while these cycles may continue now, I must never take them for granted as I gaze over fields of roundup or the continuing extinction of species in the name of growth. In the beginning of my foraging journey, 
I made slow friends, getting to know them each individually, paying attention and cherishing the small window each one gave me to come to know them better through my eyes, my fingers, my nose, my ears and my mouth. I love the never-ending thirst for answers. Why that colour? Why scent? Why then? Why now? Why toxic? Now each spring season is like walking out into a party of old friends. Their newly emerging faces greet me with such delight. Dandelions wave over with their sunshine heads and the wild garlic squeaks as loudly as I do when I see them again. My body remembers. As I squat and stretch, shuffle and rummage, I feel an extension of place and time. A living ancestor, engaging with the land, and restoring and reweaving myself as place, as a part of the land, receiving exactly what my animal body needs for this time. When I eat nettles or ground elder, wild garlic or dandelions, I try to imagine which of my ancestors loved these tastes. And which of them scrunched up their nose at the thought of it? Where might they have knowingly or unknowingly dropped seed? And what mice will tread in my track when I'm gone? It feels so important then to think of our own personal and collective ways to show gratitude. Knowing that so many of our own traditions and ceremonies with the land lie in waiting for us to unearth and reweave them. Knowing that when we engage ourselves with story, with craft, with the land and with culture, we are creating containers of potential to find ourselves again. As we engage with the simple, and vital process of gathering food to nourish ourselves. Let us remember then to nourish our souls and ignite that passion to protect that which sustains us. Let us remember So I'm going to show you how to make some bread um, and this is sweet potato and nettle bread which can be made on the campfire. So for this recipe I baked one really large baked potato and um, you can do this in the oven or on the campfire and then I scraped out the insides and I've mashed it with a little bit of salt. Now I'm going to add in some nettles. This is probably about five handfuls of nettles which have been blanched and cut up. Next, I'm going to add in 400 grams of strong white flour. And with that, I'm going to add in two tablespoons of fast action dried yeast. So you could use just regular potatoes for this and you can substitute the nettles for anything at all, really. You could put in dried seaweed or other dried herbs or dried fermented um, herbs is really good. You could put in wild garlic. There's really no end to what you could do. in and I want to make like 
kind of wet, sticky dough. more flour. Should be a good bread kneading song for this one. Not sure that I know one. Ah, I know a sweet potato song. It goes sweet, sweet potato, sweet, 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 sweet potato. Sweet, sweet potato. Sweet, 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 sweet potato. And so on. Okay, so you wanna give that some good singing, kneading love for a few more minutes. And then um, we'll just let it sit in the bowl for about five minutes before we divide it up and roll it around our sticks. So it'll give me enough time to get my fish ready and to go and carve a hazel rod. So cooking fish over the fire is probably one of my most favourite things to do. Um, I have so many memories of being a kid and going fishing with my brother and catching a fish and cooking it up. So yeah, I'm so grateful to this gorgeous rainbow trout that we got in the market that we're going to cook on the fire today. So there are so many different ways to cook fish on the fire. I think that's why I love it so much. You can cook it just over the embers with a stick right through the middle of it. You can panace it by spreading it out on two sticks as well. You can cook it in a griddle. You can cook it in newspaper. Um, um, my favorite way is to cook it in clay, which is what I'm gonna show you how to do today. So the first thing we need to do is to make sure that our fish is gutted, which this is. Thank you, Mr. Fisherman. And then we're going to stuff it with some herbs. So I'm going to take the sorrel. Do you remember that lemon of the north that we foraged earlier on? And I'm just going to stuff that inside the fish cavity. So that will give it a gorgeous lemony flavor and you could do this with so many different herbs and um, you could use like aromatic herbs like yarrow or mugwort or ground ivy or ground elder or culinary herbs like dill or fennel or tomatoes or lemons whatever you fancy so we're going to stuff that and then we're going to wrap the fish up in the leaves so these are huge big dock leaves they get much bigger later on in the year. So I really had to look very hard to find these ones that were large enough to wrap around our fish. And do make sure the leaves that you're using are non-toxic leaves. You don't wanna wrap your food up in something that's gonna poison you. Um, also being mindful of um, sometimes I'll use burdock leaves 
burdock leaves are really really huge so they're ideal for wrapping food in but they get really bitter they are really bitter so i once wrapped my foraged cookies up in burdock leaves and they were completely inedible because the leaves were so bitter so yeah do your research on your leaf wrapping but for a fish you know a little bit of bitter burdock leaf is fine uh, cold foot leaves work really well, moss works really well, and these dock leaves are really easy to identify and they get really big. And I'm just wrapping this up with some nettle fibre. Again, just use whatever's available to you. So string works just as well. This is not going to be touching the fire, so it doesn't really matter. Um, it's not going to burn. So you could use string or you could use briars, you could use cleavers even, the long fibres of cleavers. We just want to get this wrapped up nice and tight. Then we're going to get our clay. So I have some clay here which was dug from a cave that I have a strong connection with. Um, if you're looking for clay in the wild, you know you can look on the edge of riverbanks is a really good place to look or anywhere where there's lots of limestone. Um, but again, you can also use um, non-toxic clay that we use in forest school as well. I've done that quite, quite a few times. Um, and we're just going to lay it out. I've rolled it out and then we're going to wrap the fish in the clay and we want to completely seal it. Essentially what we're doing is creating like a miniature oven for the fish to cook in. Um, and it's not just fish you can do this with. You can do it with meat, you can do it with vegetables. Um, really, the sky's the limit with this. Um, you can get really creative. Bye bye little fishy, sleep well. One thing you do have to be careful of is that, is that your clay is not too wet because if your clay is too wet then it will just put out the fire which has happened to me before. And once your fish is completely sealed, I'll bring it over to the fire and uh, 
we want to set this on a really good bed of embers. So for any of this cooking or baking on the fire, it's embers that we're after. There we are, little fish oven. So the sweet potato bread has been sitting and now I've rolled it out into a long sausage and I've sharpened my hazel stick and we're just going to wrap the bread around the stick. give it to a friend to roast over the embers. <laughs>